Welcome to the presentation, Wildflowers, Food for Pollinators and People. I'm Leslie Kaiser, Garden Coordinator for CURE and a moderator for this session. Our presenter this afternoon is Christine Maloney. Christine is an advanced permaculture designer and educator who has been practicing permaculture principles and techniques for nearly two decades and fosters a deep passion for wild edibles. She leads hikes, presentations, and hands-on workshops to share knowledge and connect folks who are interested in restoring balanced food production and social practices by mimicking nature's harmonious systems, as well as the wondrous variety of edible and medicinal plants that nature offers us. Christine, we're excited to have you. Well, I'm glad to be here. Thank you so much for the invitation to share all this really neat information that, uh, that is around us. Like Leslie had mentioned, um, I am an advanced permaculture designer and educator. I have been doing all sorts of education for almost 25 years. Um, taken some classes, the master naturalist and master recycler class, as well as some, I have some other certifications. Um, and like I said, I've been a, uh, an educator, both a home educator, taught art, taught environmental um, aspects. Um, but my true passions really are wild edibles and medicinals, my organic gardening and using food as medicine. Um, and I am uh, a bit of a compost fanatic. And what I'd like to start off with today is talking about how wildflowers and using native plants for food for us as well as the pollinators fits into permaculture. Um, because as a permaculture designer, that's the lens that I see the world through and how I answer questions that might arise in my life. And so um, in order to be able to do that, we need to have a basic understanding of what permaculture is. And many people think that it's organic gardening. And that's part of it for sure. But organic gardening is what we say the gateway drug into permaculture. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, it's one way to get into understanding um, this very unique and holistic design system. The word itself actually comes from the blending of the word permanent and the word culture. So you get the word permaculture. And in essence, it's a holistic design system. It's where everything is working together based on the needs of other things um, and not just our own. So we, we tend to have a very um, human centric perspective of the world and, and the gifts that it offers. But more so than that, it helps us to regenerate our social communities as well as the land-based systems of the earth. Um, and, we, and it also helps to provide some resiliency for us um, during times of either political or personal or environmental or um, economic upheaval. Um, and, and I'll get to a little bit more of this in just a second here, but it also, um, we do this by observing and imitating the patterns that we see in nature for the benefit of all. That's the most important part is that it can't just be human focused. We do need to think about all of the creatures that we're sharing this beautiful planet with. And the ethics of permaculture, this is, uh, you know, the three main values are earth care, people care, and fair share or future care. Um, there's a couple of different ways that that can be shared, but earth care is about taking care of the physical things around us, the soil, the water, the air, the plants, the trees, and everything around us. People care is about taking care of our kin, and whether that refers to um, your biological kin, or the kindred spirits that you bring into your life that share your passions and your loves. And then fair share and future care refers to sharing resources. And I love this icon of the pie and the piece of it because it's nice to have a piece of pie, but we don't need to eat the whole thing, right? So it's about sharing resources Considering the next seven generations, um, it, that's, it's a very native uh, or aboriginal concept to think about the next seven generations of our decision-making and our actions. Um, so it's also looking towards the future and um, you know, building that resilience between ourselves as well as the natural world. And when I talk about harvesting plants and, and using those gifts from nature, I like to base it on this idea, this philosophy of honorable harvest. And this comes from a really wonderful book called Braiding Sweetgrass by Robin Wall Kimmerer. She is a Native American woman 
but also has, I believe, a doctorate in biology, and I forget exactly what her her um, her exact degrees are in. But she has this really beautiful balance of receiving native teachings from her grandmother, as well as having the scientific background of our Western society. And so her book is written from this perspective, and she provides this philosophy philosophy of honorable harvest. And um, as I've been talking, hopefully you've been reading through this, but uh, it refers to knowing the plants that you are, are harvesting from, knowing who they are, um, honoring them as, as creatures in their own right. Um, and then looking at the, the, the population that's there. So if you have a, an abundance of a population, there's much gift that that plant can be giving. Um, and it's also about recognizing that we need to be giving back as well. So she suggests, you know, maybe singing a song to the plants or, um, you know, saying thank you to the plants or even offering in their tradition, it would be a gift of, of dried tobacco. Um, but making sure that we're giving back to the earth for the gifts that we are receiving from it. Um, so it's a, a part of it also incorporates not taking everything that you see or that you grow or that you harvest because we do need to share these gifts of nature with nature herself so it's not just about our needs it's about the needs of the the butterflies and the um the bumblebees and the beetles and uh, mammals and other creatures that might use these plants for their own food or even habitat sources caution though needs to be taken when you are um collecting plants and potentially consuming them. Uh, there are obviously some very poisonous plants like poison ivy that you would never want to touch, much less put in your mouth or sample. Um, and don't even believe everything that I'm saying. Please do your own research. Um, you know, find somebody who can go with you to identify plants together, hopefully somebody that's more knowledgeable um, so that you're not guessing. So you never want to guess about the plants that you are first of all, touching, and then also harvesting and consuming. Um, you can never be too positive, right? So always make sure that you are absolutely certain that what you are collecting is, is what you want to be consuming. Um, and then it is really important and it's very difficult, unfortunately, um, but using Latin names for your identification is really important because there are multiple plants called self-heal. But what if you took the wrong plant called self-heal and it did, you know, you had some um, unpleasant uh, reaction to it. Um, knowing what the Latin name for your plant is really helps to make sure that you are collecting the right thing. So using Latin names, um, although it's more difficult, is super helpful in making sure that you're getting the right plant. Then the last thing I recommend is to do a tolerance test. Um, this is a, a multi-step process where you can see if your body is going to react to the plant either um, you know maybe you have a rash or an upset stomach or something so the first thing you'd want to do when you are looking at various plants that you are going to be collecting is to do a skin test so you might take the leaf um, again make sure you're not uh, grabbing poison ivy or some other plant that you may have a photosensitive reaction to. So take the leaf, kind of crush it in your hand and then rub it on your skin and see after an hour or so if you've had any skin reaction to it. If you haven't, you can go on to the next step. And the next step would be to take a small portion of the leaf, chew it up in your mouth and then spit it out. You don't want to consume it yet at this point. So you're going to spit it out and after an hour, see if you have any reaction in your mouth. If you don't, you can proceed on to the next step, which is to take a small portion of it, chew it and swallow it. Wait an hour and see if you have any reaction. And then um, slowly build up your, uh, your consumption of wild edibles very slowly. The plants that are growing out in nature often have to, um, struggle really hard to survive. Uh, their life is not easy, like the salads or vegetables that you, you get at the grocery store that have been grown in perfect conditions. Many of these wild edible plants are struggling and fighting for survival and they are so chock full of nutrients. 
um, that our bodies have a hard time digesting them in large quantities at first. So it's really important to try a really small amount. So if you are harvesting dandelion or purslane or some other common edible, um, you might try maybe just a half of a leaf at first. Um, if you tried to eat a huge salad of wild edibles or drink a large quantity of tea from wild edibles, um, you may have a very adverse abdominal reaction. Um, your body just can't handle all of the, the high fiber and the, um, the, the dense nutrients that the wild edibles have. So you're gonna be eating this in very, very small quantities. So we're gonna get into our first plant. I will provide the Latin name um, or at least the genus and we're going to start with goldenrod. Um, these really aren't listed in any particular order except for the fact that I saved the, my favorite two for last. So I hope you stay with me through the entire presentation so that uh, you can see all 10 of these fun and easy plants that you can um, identify it, you know, maybe, or even potentially grow in your own backyard. So Solidago uh, species is a wide family. Um, there's over 20 different goldenrod plants within this family. Um, most of them are native. Uh, there are a few that uh, can grow very aggressive aggressively. So the one in this picture here is Solidago canadensis. And it tends to be a very aggressive weedy plant. Um, it grows by rhizome, so it can take over an area fairly easily and quickly. It's a, it's a fast growing plant. Um, in the ways that this plant provides food for us is in these ways. So the flowers can be collected and eaten raw. You can eat it right off of the plant if you wanted to. You could add them to a salad or you could dry the entire aerial part of the plant. So you could cut it off at the base. And like I said, this plant grows by rhizomes. So you're not hurting the plant by cutting it off because those rhizomes hold all of that energy and will regrow the plant. So you can cut the plant at ground level, hang it upside down and dry it in your house in a, in a warm, dry place. And then um, over winter, take small amounts of it and make some tea. Now the young leaves are also edible. Um, those are really great raw. You can take off this, the, typically the smaller ones near the top um, are they gonna be the ones that are more tender. The ones that are growing closer to the ground or that are older or really dark green are gonna be quite tough and probably not very palatable, especially to our Western palates. Um, we like our baby kale and baby spinaches and many of these plants will have either uh, a toothsomeness to it, like a, a density to it that's a, a little, a little tougher to chew. Um, but you can also cook the leaves, which will help to soften them. So you could cook them, and uh, you could add them to soups or stews. Cook them in with your rice um, in in small pieces, uh, or you could sauté them and add some garlic and onion to it and eat it that way. Again, the leaves can also be used as a tea. So cutting off that aerial portion, everything that's above ground and then drying it and using it as a tea. Um, the plant does have medicinal, ben uh, medicinal benefits for us as well. And as I go through the presentation, I will provide four health benefits for us humans and then five pollinators or um, native creatures that are dependent on these plants, which if, um, I guess I didn't say this at the beginning of the presentation, but I also do work for Shirley Hines Land Trust. And we have um, an award that we pass out called the Bringing Nature Home Award, which encourages folks to plant native gardens. And uh, one of the reasons that it's important to do so is so that the native pollinators like the bees and the beetles and the butterflies and moths and um, uh, chipmunks, all have a habitat and have food sources um, and places where they can raise their young. So I will provide five um, creatures that are dependent on this particular plant. So what this is going to do is it's going to bring this full circle into the three ethics of permaculture. The earth care is that we are providing food, habitat, um, and a resting place for the creatures of the earth. We're enriching the soil and protecting it by planting native plants. We are 
um, fulfilling the people care aspect of permaculture by recognizing that these plants have nutrition to give us. Um, they have health benefits for our bodies. And then this is also um, fulfilling the third ethic of permaculture of fair share because we're sharing resources with nature. And it is part of future care because these plants are long lived and they can sustain themselves through all of our crazy Midwestern weather. So, you know, we have really extreme temperatures in the winter and in the summer, we go through periods of drought and periods of um, intense rain. Um, and these plants are survivors. These are, these are the strong ones that, um, you know, can, can tolerate our, our very intense weather patterns. So these, uh, that, that's how all of these slides will be organized is that you can see the earth care portion of it, the people care portion and the fair share and future care portion of each of these plants. Because I love interweaving all of these concepts together. Um, it really helps to provide a broader understanding of our place in the world and, and in the future. So Solidago, uh, commonly known as goldenrod, very small yellow flowers. Uh, it's a very upright plant, can be anywhere from three to five feet tall um, and uh, has some medicinal and edible qualities. Um, all of the wildflowers that I'm talking about today will have one or both of those. Um, so these are all really fun plants to put in your garden. The next one is New England aster. This is in the aster family. There are many, many thousands of plants in the aster family. Dandelion is one of them as well in the aster family. Um, asters have long, typically long ray flowers. The ones are the, the ray flowers are the ones that are coming off of it, kind of like the rays of a sun. And then the disc flowers are in the center. And there are many varietals of New England aster. Um, many different cultivars as well. So you can go to a nursery and get um, a cultivar of New England aster. And um, it will probably have the same qualities. Um, I, I haven't come across any scientific research to verify whether the cultivars have different qualities to them as far as nutritionally or within the habitat. Um, but New England aster is, is a beautiful purple flower and with yellow, disc flowers. This one blooms pretty late. So this one can bloom anywhere from September through November, depending on your, your weather and where you're located. Um, but it is a late season food source for pollinators. So this is really important. So when many of the other flowers have already died and they are, um, you know, they're already seeding, New England aster is providing a, a, a last minute food source for our local pollinators and creatures. So, you know, when, um, when October rolls around, um, New England aster is a really beautiful plant to have around, but it also has these really great attributes to it. You can take the petals, pull them off of the flower and add them to your salad. You can eat them raw, just right in the garden if you want to. Um, I have added them to smoothies before. Um, and I've also read that you can make a tea out of them. Now, the ones that I have growing in my backyard, I was just able to harvest them um, back in December, November, December last year. So I haven't made a tea yet. So you'll notice on my slides, if there's something that has an asterisk by it, it means that I haven't tried it. But if it is just the standard words like raw, salad, smoothie, or cooked, um, and there's no asterisk, I have actually tried it. And um, I can speak from experience about uh, consuming these things. So the petals are edible. The leaves, when they're young, they are also raw, edible raw. So you can harvest them straight from the plants. If you need a, a, a garden snack while you're out there in your um, wildflower garden, you can eat them right off the plant. Um, the older ones are better if they're cooked, um, but the young ones you can definitely eat raw or put into a salad, add to a smoothie. Um, and then the root um, in my research is medicinal as well. So that can be dug up and um, dried and used like a tea. Some of its qualities are that it is antispasmodic, it's a decongestant, it's an expectorant and an antidiarrheal. So these qualities are things that may have been proven by science, um, but many of them might be anecdotal uh, or they're based on uh, writings from 
um, the early 1900s. So I don't want to say that these are all absolutely positive because I, I, I haven't tried I haven't tried them all. So um, like I said before, make sure you're doing your own research, but um, hopefully this workshop will give you uh, an understanding of the things, the, the flowers that you can plant in your garden um, to attract local pollinators, but also provide food for us as well. But again, do your own research. Um, the critters that depend on New England aster uh, include the tarnished plant bug, chrysanthemum lace bug, potato aphid, wild turkeys will eat the leaves, um, and then the tiger moth will lay its eggs on there and um, the, the caterpillars use that as a food source. Here we have spiderwort. I love spiderwort. Um, some of you may know spiderwort by its other common name, snotweed. <laughs> so not a very pleasant name, but it is very, um, it's very appropriately descriptive of the plant because you can take the leaf and pull it off the plant or rip the leaf in half and it will ooze this gooey, clear, snotty liquid. So children often love to smear it on each other um, <laughs> because it's just fun, but it is also very healing for your skin as well. So you can, you can rub that on your skin, um, and it will, uh, uh, it will help with like skin issues, but the flowers on this are edible. Um, I love to just pop them right off and, and eat them right in the garden. Um, they don't last very long. I've noticed, but I love their blue purple color. Um, that does indicate that it has different, nutrients in it, kind of like how a blueberry has different nutrients compared to a raspberry or cantaloupe. Um, the colors often indicate what nutrients might be in them. So um, it's great that, you know, the first three colors we saw were yellow, purple, and blue. Um, each one of those is going to have their own unique um, nutritional attributes to them. Uh, like I said, I just eat them raw. If, if they make it into the house, you could put it in your salad or smoothie. Um, they, they are really beautiful. They make a, a lovely decoration on top of salads. Um, the leaves can be eaten raw, especially when they're young and small, they're more tender. Um, again, add them to salads. And I assume that they could be cooked, at least uh, my research on the internet uh, said that they could be cooked. I haven't done that yet. Um, and again, the roots can also be used for tea. So um, we have lots of really fun tea sources that we'll be talking about. Um, the, the plants in this species, uh, Tradescantia, um, there are several different types, which is why it says SPP. There's uh, several different types of, of spider warts. Um, you know, some are for the prairie, some just have different uh, physical characteristics to them. Um, but it is said that uh, it's a good laxative. Um, like I said, it's good for skin issues. So it's good for spider bites and bee stings that you might get, um, open cuts or wounds. Um, it's an analgesic, which means it's a pain reliever um, and can also be used as a sedative. Several of the critters that depend on it are the halictid bees, cirphid bees, model sand grasshopper, rabbits will eat it. They're not super fond of it, but they will if they need to. Um, and then leaf beetles as well. And I think most people know about violets. Violets are in the viola family or genus, sorry. Um, we know them because of their uh, cute heart-shaped leaves and their five petaled flowers. They can come in a variety of colors. So they can come in blue, yellow, white, a pinky magenta, purple. And then there's some that are even white and purple and those are pretty cool too. Um, the, both the flowers and the leaves are edible on this. Uh, I eat these almost from the time they first appear in spring. So this is anywhere from April until July. Past that point, they start to get a little tough and unpleasant. Um, but they are one of my favorites. Um, I, I do love violets a lot. Um, I think I prefer the, the flavor of the leaf over the flower. And so that's something interesting that you should try is, you know, try them side by side. Um, try different colors. If you happen to have a couple different colors of flowers, the yellow ones will taste a slightly different than the magenta ones or different than the white ones. Um, I, like I said, I prefer the leaves um, and I'm not sure why. I just, I love the texture um, and the flavor is just 
very light. Um, some of the other plants that I've talked about, they do have a bit of a green flavor. So I mean, <laughs> kind of like eating grass or just, you know, plain herbs. Um, they, they can be a little more uh, forward flavored, um, whereas violets are very tender and very, very easy to eat. So like I said, the flowers are good. You can eat them raw, salad, smoothie. Um, some people will also sugar them. So painting them with egg white and then dipping them in sugar, they make a beautiful cake decoration. Um, you can also use the flowers to make jellies and jams um, or even simple syrups. And then the, root, the leaves are good, raw salad, smoothie or cooked. So violets are high in vitamin A and vitamin C, um, also known to be a sedative, a decongestant, anti-inflammatory. And then some of the, the critters that depend on it are the dusky wing skippers, the wriggle fertility, the Aphrodite fertility, the Eucerin minor bees, and the Diana caterpillars. So lots of, lots of really cool insects. I think I just like the names. <laughs> I love all those names. Someone had fun naming them. Uh, the next one is Troutly, Erythonium americanum. Um, this is an early spring wildflower. The leaves will come up anywhere between March and May. They are mottled, kind of like a trout, has little uh, faded spots on them, kind of a greenish brownish color. The leaves are a little bit waxy and um, almost like a succulent sort of plant. Um, they keep really well in the refrigerator, I found. So when you are out in the woods hiking or if you happen to have some in your property and you see some leaves, um, you can harvest quite a few of them um, and they'll keep well in the fridge. The one thing you do need to be careful about though is that trout lily, um, although it grows by underground runner, it grows very slowly. And when it does grow and it's ready to reproduce, the first year, it will produce a single leaf. And if you harvest that single leaf, you will kill that plant's ability to reproduce. Because the first year, it's a biennial. So the first year it grows one leaf, and then the second year it grows a second leaf. And when it's growing that second leaf is when it flowers. So when you're out in the forest, in order to practice honorable harvest with this very slow growing plant, the best thing to do is to only harvest the second leaf. And you can tell because they both come from the same point on the rhizome. Even though the rhizome is, is underground and you can't see the rhizome, you can tell that both of the leaves are coming out of the same spot. Um, you may be lucky enough to see the flower pod or the flower bud before it opens or even the open flower. And that's another really good indicator that it is okay to harvest um, one of those leaves so that the plant can continue to regenerate. Um, but the flowers are edible. Um, again, same with pretty much all flowers. Uh, typically the smaller the flower I found, um, the more likely it is you can eat the entire flower. Whereas with the larger flowers, I personally only like to eat the petals. Um, we're not gonna talk about daylilies because daylilies are not a native, um, but daylily flowers are edible but I don't like to eat the pistils and stamens. There's something about the flavor and you'll have to do your own taste test. Um, again, make sure you do that tolerance test first. Um, but you may, you know, want to try the entire flower. Maybe you don't mind the pistils and stamens, either the texture or the flavor, um, or with the smaller flowers, you may be okay eating the whole thing. So that's something for you to learn about your own preferences and to, to play with and practice with. Um, and then the leaves are good raw in a salad or in a smoothie. Um, because they are a little bit waxy, their, their texture is a little mucilaginous. And by that, I kind of mean like creamy or snotty, but like in a good way, if that's possible. <laughs> um, but they're, they're pretty tasty and they kind of have like a light citrusy flavor to them. Um, like I said, I think they're one of my favorites. And then, um, because they have that waxiness, they're good for skin ailments. Supposedly they're good as a contraceptive. Native Americans used to use it as such. Um, and it's an, an anti-febrile. So that means that it helps to bring down fevers. 
Uh, some of the creatures that depend on it are mason bees, trout lily minor bees. There's a um, there's scientific evidence that there's a particular ant that is um, a, a symbiotic host for it. Um, the ants will collect the seeds after the, the flower has dropped them on the ground. And the seed has a little pocket, a little oily, sugary pocket on it that has a lot of nutrients in it. So the ants will collect the seeds, carry the seeds to a new location, eat that sugar pocket, that oily, yummy sugar pocket, and then leave the seed there because they don't want the seed. They want that yummy goodness. And then that plant now has a new opportunity to grow away from the parent plant and uh, continue the, the expansion of the territory of the plant. So it's kind of a really cool symbiotic connection between um, this particular plant, Erythronium americanum, and ants. I thought that was kind of fascinating. Um, White-tailed deer have been known to eat on them, but because of their modeling, um, it's actually kind of difficult for them to see the, the leaves against the background of the forest floor. So that's a, a cool evolutionary technique that the plant has for survival. And then also the Western honeybee is known to um, collect the nectar from the plant. Our next plant is called evening primrose. Uh, it's in the Onothera uh, species. I'm sorry, the Onothera gena, genus, and there are multiple subspecies of this plant family. There are dozens and dozens of, uh, of, of fam families, family members in the Onothera genus. Um, I love this plant. The, the petals are very light and, and slightly sweet. Um, the plant itself, standard is between two and three feet tall, but last year, for some reason, I had one that grew 10 feet tall astounded me. I had no idea it could do that. It was trying to outcompete a, a nearby plant though. So I think it was really trying to reach for the sunlight. Um, but yeah, I'd never seen a plant grow that big. Standard is like between two, maybe four feet. It would be like tops max. Um, it's got really beautiful dark green leaves. Um, and then uh, four petals. Each petal uh, is connected on its own. And they're kind of heart-shaped petals. Uh, like I said, I do love the petals. I'll walk by the plant and and, and just eat them right off of the plant. Um, they're a bit more tender than some other flowers are. I just pick each of the petals off. Again, I don't like the pistils and stamens. Uh, <laughs> it's just a texture thing. Um, but they're, they're, they're really uh, delicate. So you want to pick them very carefully. They'll bruise very easily. Um, the young leaves also can be eaten raw they are a little on the hairy side. I'm gonna be honest, it's not my favorite to eat raw, but I like the fact that each plant has its own nutrients to it. So just like kale is a little bit different than spinach, is a little bit different than um, a red lettuce or a romaine lettuce, like each plant has its own nutrient values in different, differing amounts or different trace minerals. Um, so I do eat all of these, uh, all of these plants that we were talking about, um, I try to eat some of them raw, some of them cooked, or some of them in a smoothie, um, just because I like to make sure that I'm getting a variety of nutrients in my diet, just because our standard American diet is so lacking um, that it's really important to give our bodies the building blocks that it needs from all of these gifts uh, that, that nature is offering us. So the, the young leaves, um, I may recommend doing more of like a cooked thing. So like chopping them up and adding them to soups or your rice or, um, you know, whatever you're, you're cooking might make them a little bit more palatable. Um, although I haven't done that, nor have I tried the tea yet, but the seeds are one of the most well-known um, nutritional aspects of evening primrose. You can go to the health food store and actually buy bottles of evening primrose oil. Um, it's well documented throughout the ages as a food source as well as a medicinal source. Um, I've heard that the seed pods are cooked, but I have never caught them in time to be able to try that, um, as are the roots and um, also are a really good food source, raw or cooked, and that there's um, quite a bit of evidence in the uh, anthropological record of the early Americans or the early Europeans 
in speaking with the Native Americans, they used it as a, a, an important food source. Um, those seeds that I've talked about are really high in omega-6 fatty acids, which is really unusual for plants to have such a high quantity of, of omega-6 fatty acids. Um, it's also considered an analgesic. Again, that means that it is a pain reliever, um, supposedly very good for menopause and PMS. So like I said, when you go to the health food store, um, the evening primrose does tend to be in the women's section. Um, but it can be used for many other things as well, including skin conditions. Um, but there are some really important cre creatures that depend on this, like the sphinx moth, hummingbirds, leaf beetles, stilt bugs, and the grape, grape leaf folder moth. That's a mouthful to say. <laughs> but that sounded really cool when I was typing that in, or that when I had researched that, that the grape leaf folder moth likes evening primrose. How about that? Next one we're going to talk about is swamp rose mallow, um, hibiscus mosquitoes. Um, I do want to say something about the Latin names. I don't know if I'm saying them right, but the one thing that I heard is that the best way to say a Latin name is with confidence. <laughs> say it like you know it. So I'm going to say that this is hibiscus mosquitoes because um, that's just, um, I'm just going with it. Um, this plant can get five to seven feet tall. It's a very, um, it's got larger leaves than many of the other plants that we do. This can be used um, in rain gardens. It's actually where I have it planted in my yard is in my rain garden. Um, it likes wet feet. So if you've got a, a wet marshy area in your yard or somewhere where that gets a lot of uh, down downpour, either like a, um, a low spot in your yard or where the gutters happen to come off. Uh, this is a really great plant to put in your rain garden. Um, and it's beautiful as well. Unfortunately, it's pretty short lived um, as far as the petals go. And the petals are the edible part. Um, actually, no, the leaves are as well. But the petals are the most delicious part. Um, <laughs> um, this is, uh, you know, it's in the hibiscus genus. So like the tea that you get from the grocery store that says zinger on it or hibiscus tea, this is that same plant. Um, you might have a different family member, but anything in the hibiscus family, including Rose of Sharon, which is a common landscaping plant, those petals are edible as well. Um, it's super easy to grow. Uh, it's a short-lived perennial. But like I said, the petals are edible. Um, you can eat them raw, put them in a salad, make a tea out of them, either fresh or dried. So when they're in abundance, um, you can collect the petals, set them out um, in, a, in a, a somewhat dark or unsunny location so that they can dry out and then enjoy them all winter long or you can add them to your smoothies. Um, the young leaves are pretty good. Um, I would say they're kind of in the medium area for texture. Um, they do have a little bit of toothsomeness to it, but not quite as, as, as toothsome as the um, New England Aster or the um, Evening Primrose. So this is one that you could definitely do more so in a salad, um, but then the older leaves can also be cooked as well. Um, according to my research, it is antifungal. It's an expectorant, antifebrile, meaning um, it uh, helps to combat fevers. And it's also high in vitamin C and calcium. Um, now, almost all of these plants are, are high in calcium. The leaves are high in calcium. Um, so you can even go to the grocery store and pretty much every green leaf uh, every plant that's a green leafy plant is going to have uh, varying amounts of calcium in it. Um, so, you know, I think about my mom who's 75 years old and has some bone density issues. And if you need a good source of calcium, your um, wild edible greens are a great place to be getting a natural source that's easy to um, assimilate into our bodies. This plant is also really important, not just for us, but for these critters as well. The velvet leaf seed beetle, the rose mallow bee, the checkered skipper, and the gold green sweat bee, as well as hummingbirds. And we all love hummingbirds. And um, obviously those colors are definitely going to attract them to, um, 
to, to suck the nectar out. And they're, they're just so beautiful and showy. The flowers can be anywhere from four, four to five inches across. So it's a really stunningly beautiful plant. Columbine. Um, the native one is called Aquilegia canadensis, and there are plenty of cultivars that you can get. The, the one that's pictured here is the native one. Uh, it's reddish with a yellow center, and it grows maybe two to three feet tall. A uh, very slender plant um, with unique shaped flowers, um, almost like a, a paw print. Um, those flowers are edible, both raw salad and smoothie. Um, and the cultivars are edible as well. Uh, some of the cultivars look more like a daisy in that they have the ray flowers and the disc flowers, um, kind of like I had mentioned with the New England aster, it's in the aster family. Um, so some of them look a little bit different, but all the petals are edible. I actually prefer the flavor of the natural, the native ones. So like these red with the yellow are very sweet. They have a, a, a rich nectar flavor to them. So they're really quite tasty, but all the other parts you need to practice caution. Um, some parts of them can be toxic, but they also can be medicinal as well. So um, I think of it as a continuum and a plant, if it's safe for us to eat and nutritious, it's on the safe end of the continuum. And then as you grow, go across the continuum, um, a plant could be, um, actually I think on the, the far end would be plants that are um, safe for us to eat as well as very tasty. And those are the things that we really like to eat. Those are the things that we seek out when we go to the grocery store, we're looking for those really tasty foods. So on the continuum then would be foods that are safe to eat, but maybe not so tasty. Um, and that might be some of the greens that I've mentioned today. Um, then if you go continue on that, that, that uh, continuum, there might be foods that are medicinal. And then after that, you might have foods that are toxic. And of course, the, at the very end would be plants that are fatal. So um, the rest of the plants of the Aquilegia canadensis and, and its cultivars um, are on that side, that center part of, the, um, of that continuum from being medicinal to being toxic. Um, I haven't heard that it's fatal, but it's definitely um, one that you need to practice caution with. Um, it can be used supposedly as a parasitide, which would mean like if you had parasites in your gut, um, you, uh, uh, unpleasant things that maybe you picked up when you went to another country or just in um, contaminated water or something, that it could potentially be used as a parasitide um, as a diuretic just means that it really helps to flush liquids out of you, antispasmodic and antidiarrheal. So like I said at the very beginning, practice caution, be 150% certain, um, get, uh, um, get somebody else's opinion um, and do your own research. Uh, please do not take my word for it. Um, this is one thing where I've, I've eaten the flowers and the flowers are safe to eat, but I have not worked with the rest of the plant. So those are things that I've just researched and learned about, but not actually practiced. But Aquilegia is a really important food and habitat source for the Columbine sawfly, for leaf miner flies, halictid beetles, hummingbirds, and the borer moth. Obviously you can think about the hummingbird and um, them sticking their cute little, um, nose into the flower to um, get that nectar. So a very important food source. Spring beauty. So we are on plant number eight. Claytonia virginica is one of my two favorite plants to harvest. Um, I think part of it is just because it's such a beautiful harbinger of sprint, spring. It is a tiny little plant, um, barely two to three, maybe four inches tall at its, at its tallest. And the tiny little flowers are maybe three fourths of an inch long, but they're white with purple stripes in it. So the, those, the purple striping is barely faint in that photo. Um, and its leaves are long and narrow. So the, the, the flowers themselves are edible, the leaves are also edible, and the tubers, um, which is kind of fun. The, the only thing is it's hard to collect enough of them to make it worthwhile to eat because um, the plant, the stem of it from the tip of the flower to the ground is maybe, like I said, two to four inches. And then below ground, about six inches below ground 
is where you'll find the tuber for Claytonia virginica. And it's a very, very deep tuber and it's tiny. It's maybe the size of a marble, but it's called a fairy spud. Like how cute is that? It's such a tiny little a, a spud, a little potato tasting thing, um, but it can be eaten raw or you could boil it and add it in your, in your soups or um, just cook it in a, sa in a saute pan. Um, but it tastes like raw potato. It's really delicious. Um, <laughs> so I think that's one of the things I like about it is that it's also called fairy spuds or fairy potatoes. Um, and it is pretty tasty. Uh, it is high in vitamin A and vitamin C, both the flowers and the rest of the plant. Um, Anti-rheumatic, so helping to relieve with um, inflammation. And because I, I think one of the other things I like about this plant is that it's one of the only ones that has a starch to it. Um, and of course, there are, there are other plants that have starches. Um, uh, sunchoke is another one that I'm not going to be able to talk about today, but um, it has an edible tuber as well that's rich in starch. Um, so it's hard to find plants that have starches to them. Um, but Claytonia virginica is one of them, if you can collect enough. Um, but it's also analgesic, meaning that it helps to relieve pain. And then some of the critters that are dependent on it are the cuckoo bees, the giant bee fly, the white-footed mouse. Um, and the eastern chipmunk will actually dig up those tubers and eat them. Um, so it's an important food source for them as well. Um, and the andronid bees. So all of those are um, dependent on this plant. Um, this also is a woodland plant. So this is going to be in undisturbed wooded soils, uh, kind of prefers wetter soils as well. Um, and it blooms in early spring. So typically in May is when you're gonna find this plant. Now my absolute very favorite plant is Asclepia syriaca. Asclepius syriaca, common milkweed, is um, there's actually multiple plants in this uh, genus and um, common milkweed is how most of us know it. It is edible in nearly every single stage of life. So it's young sprouts when it first comes up in the spring can be pulled and eaten like asparagus when it's boiled. You notice that most of these are, are cooked. Um, the growing tips, so the last, the top two or four inches, those can be popped off and boiled for two or three minutes. The flower buds, so if you look in this picture here, they're in the back, they're tightly closed up. It kind of looks like loose broccoli and it tastes like that as well. The flowers are also edible. You can pop those, pick them right off if you want to and eat them. They're very floral tasting. So the aroma from the plant is, is intoxicating. It's wonderful. It's one of my favorite aromas, um, but the flowers taste like it. So you have to be willing to, um, if you wanna try it, understand that it's going to taste floral. Um, then the, the seed pods when they're really young, so anywhere from like one inch to maybe two inches, those can be boiled and they, they have a flavor reminiscent of broccoli or asparagus. Um, and then the seeds, uh, I've heard that they can be roasted. I actually heard this from a Native, a, a Native American um, woman. Um, she says that she's roasted them and eaten them and I haven't gotten that far in my tasting process yet. Um, but she says they're pretty good. The sap from milkweed, um, that's how it gets its name milk, because when you break the leaves off, it exudes a white sap, is said to be a good wart remover. Um, the plant also supposedly is good for lung diseases, um, that uh, white latex that comes out of it can be used as a chewing gum substitute. I haven't tried that, sounds like fun. Um, or it could be used as an expectorant. And of course, we all know that the monarch butterfly relies heavily on milkweed and not just Asclepia syriaca, but all of all the different types of milkweeds. Um, the milkweed tiger moth also depends on um, the milkweed plants, the mullen weevil, long tongued bees and the sphinx moth. Um, so I think I just love the fact that this plant is so generous in all of its gifts because every single aspect of its life can be feeding us, but it can also be um, a, a food source and a habitat source for so many other creatures as well. 
Um, this is just a little teaser page. These are some of the other plants that you could look up to learn more about their edible flowers and how they can be habitat and home for, or habitat and food for um, some of our other local and native creatures. Uh, red bud, prickly pear cactus, basswood, elder, golden alexanders, nanny berry, trillium, bee balm are just a few. Um, some of the resources that I wanted to pass along to you, these first three um, resources are permaculture related. So if you're interested in learning more about permaculture, there's a great book called Gaia's Garden by Toby Hemingway. The Permaculture Handbook is a really great introduction to permaculture and how to implement it in your, in your garden and in your yard. That's by Peter Bain. And Maura Gamble, she's an Australian who has a, a, perma, a YouTube video called Our Permaculture Life. Now these next resources are wild edibles related. So I'd mentioned at the very beginning, the books Braiding Sweetgrass by Robin Wall Kimmerer. Um, another really great book just about foraging and how to use the things that you forage um, provides recipes as well as the book called The Forager's Harvest by Samuel Thayer. Several of the web websites that I was resourcing um, and researching from are Eat the Weeds, Plants for a Future, and the one at the very bottom, the Illinois Wildflowers. Um, and then the book, it, uh, Flora of the Chicago Region, uh, is a classic in the botany and uh, conservation world. And if you want a couple of apps for your phone to help you positively identify plants. Uh, I use PlantNet, but uh, you could also use Seek, which is an offshoot of iNaturalist. So I wanna open it up for a few questions. Hi, Christine. We have a question about the potato aphids. The participant states, now I never want potato aphids. So does growing New England aster pull the aphids away from the potatoes? Yeah, no, it would definitely provide another food source for the potato aphids, but providing um, a food source, you are also encouraging them to procreate. So it's gonna have a, a, a mixed benefit, but if you go back to the permaculture principles and um, even the idea of honorable harvest is that when we're planting, we want to recognize that we're not the only creatures that need that particular food source. So plant three times as much as you want to harvest. So it is enough for all. It has to be for the benefit of all because we're all living on this planet. We have another question. This one is about the trout lilies. The participant states that they planted trout lilies in their garden about three years ago, and they wonder if you might know why they haven't bloomed yet. They're a very slow growing plant, and it could take seven or eight years for it to get established enough to be to be strong enough to procreate because, you know, a lot of energy for a plant to be able to do that. And it's just a very slow growing plant. It depends on the habitat. I don't know how moist or shaded your soil is, but that's its preferred habitat is, is shady and moist. But yeah, it just takes a, it's a, it's a slow plant. All right. Well, thank you so much for your time and, and helping to share this information.